Man, I tell you, this uncommon engineering thing gets unbelievable more and more each day. We got a dude on here today, Michael Fronty. You know him as the main guy for Spearhead and one of the great social consciousness uh, musicians in the globe right now. He's a local Davis. I knew him back when he was a hooper, back when he was a young guy for the Blue Devils here in town, have been tracking his amazing career all around the globe, his various styles of music. Hard to pinpoint what he is, but dang, he's right on point with what he's talking about with the people in the globe. And I want to lead this thing off with a little trailer from his video on Stay Human about why he plays music. This will introduce you to Michael in the best possible way. All of us are given these little tools or like gems in life that help us to figure out the world. And I almost feel sometimes it was like kind of a cruel joke that I was given music. The reason I started playing music is that I thought it could change the world. I spent over 20 years on the road. Almost everywhere I go, I see a battle taking place between cynicism and optimism. And I feel it in myself too. Throughout the years, I've met people whose lives collided with mine at precisely the right moments. Just to say I love you. You saw those kids, you would do anything for them. And you know what, they would do anything for you. When I needed inspiration, when I was questioning my sense of purpose. Sustainability is about socially having stability understanding how harmony is achieved is really important. <laughs> <laughs> they remind me of what it means to be at your best as a human being. So those things are inspiration, they are motivations to, to keep going, to keep grinding. The world is made up of millions of people doing millions of little things to make a difference. And I want to stoke those flames. All any of us have in life is what we feel. It's the thing that we're born with, and it's the last thing that we have when we leave. No one is born perfect, and that is the one thing that unites all of us. You restored my faith. It's extraordinary. You gave me hope tonight. Yeah. are the stories of people who made me think differently about my life, my music, and what it means to stay human. All of us have an unlimited capacity to love. It's extraordinary. Oh, what you are selling, I am buying. Like, <laughs> what, what's on your heart and soul right now with all these crazy uh. things? Well, Dan, thanks for sharing that clip. And, and I want to give a big shout out to everybody in Davis. It's the town where I grew up. It shaped me in so many ways. And, um, you know, playing sports and, and growing up in Davis uh, were two things that, I, that carry out through everything that I do today, you know. Um, that film that you just saw the trailer for is a film that I made over five years traveling around the world playing music. And every day I'd go out into the world and I would meet people along the way right after the moments when I would pick up my phone in the morning and go, what the fuck is going on out there, you know? And today, obviously, is no different. You know, we're looking at what's going on in the news. And we thought, like, how could 2020 get any more intense than it, than it could with COVID and everything else that's going on? Um, but it, it's gone to a whole new level. But I meet people every day who inspire me people who are doing extraordinary things, just ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things to make a difference in the lives of other people. And they remind me of what it means to hold on to my humanity and to, to, um, to remain optimistic, even in the face of an incredible challenge. And I think that that's one of the biggest lessons that I learned in my life growing up in sports was that, was that through teamwork, through optimism, through embracing that everybody on the team has a different personality, has a different skill set, has different ideas about what we're doing. But if we can all sort of shape it into we're going in one direction, 
that we can do incredible things together. And I've approached that in music, uh, approached my music the same way, my business the same way, and my message. And really at the core of it, what my message is, is two things, is, is um, the, the power of cynicism over, uh, uh, the power of optimism over cynicism. And then secondly, that different is beautiful. Different is beautiful. And um, right now, obviously the way that that's playing out in our society is um, with this history, not just this most recent killing of George Floyd, but the history of systemic racism that we've seen in, in policing in our country through, throughout from, from slavery until today. And now people are really waking up to it and, and saying, how can we um, do things differently? And, and I have a lot of friends who are police officers who are really good people. I have a brother who's a cop. Um, and who are really good people, who are who caring people, who are there really for the right reasons to serve, to protect the community. And then you have some who are not that, don't have that mentality, but they're all within this system that is designed to, to keep people failing rather than support people becoming successful. And especially, I live in San Francisco in Hunters Point, which is a, which is a black community. And especially there, we, we've seen the effects of it for decades. But now people are finally starting to wake up and say that we, we can't have this be the way that it's been. And, you know, sports is a, is, is a huge indicator of that. I mean, look, look at what the main meme has been over the last week has been that cop kneeling on that guy's neck right next to the picture of Colin Kaepernick kneeling to take a peaceful protest to say, look, y'all, I'm trying to tell you there's something that's going on out there. And um, I, I, I really believe that at the end of the day that there's gonna be positive things that come out of it. But right now we're in an incredibly painful time. Although I understand all of the circumstances that have led up to people's um, anger and just being furious. I mean, I, I pick up my phone and I see these images of, of, of month after month, year after year, and it makes my blood boil every single time I see them of police violence. But the violence that we're seeing in the street right now is not helping. It's not getting us to where we're going. Although I understand it, I don't condone it. And um, we need to be strategic. We need to take our, our pain and put it towards something that is, uh, uh, has a strategy to get us to where we're wanting to go, which is we want to have education, we want to have jobs, we want to have health care, we want to have programs for youth, we want to have sports, we want to have art, we want to have music. Um, we want to have financial stability for people. We want to get people out of prisons for petty nonviolent offenses, for drug offenses. And we want to get people into treatment who need treatment for drugs. And these things are not going to just change overnight, but they do change when the culture changes. And that's what we're seeing right now. And it's a time for all of us to begin to speak up and have those uncomfortable conversations within our family, with our neighbors, and, and within our communities so that we can change the culture that says this this kind of policing is no longer acceptable you also in one of your other docs i know you went into baghdad and just kind of went in there and then i think you yeah. went to israel and i i thought one of the quotes you had which was super awesome was it wasn't so much really about religion it was had really to do a lot with poverty and and economics yeah. you know just talk about your experience with that whole deal talk about being uncommon that's that's something everybody doesn't do every day you know, I, I was watching the news in, in 2003, and um, the war had just started. We were on our tour bus traveling through the states and watching the news on the bus. And um, there was these reports of, you know, generals and politicians explaining the political cost and the economic cost of the war without ever getting into the human cost of the war. And I said, you know, Baghdad's a city of 5 million people and we're bombing it with this operation called shock and awe, which to me is like, that is, a, you know, just the name itself is, is designed to put fear into people's hearts. And these five ton bunker buster bombs that were being dropped in the middle of the city. And I said, what's it like for people on the ground there, for Iraqi civilians who are, uh, who are being uh, taken the full force of this bombing, but also for um, US soldiers who are there doing it. And um, so I decided to hop on a 16-passenger uh, plane. I first I flew from New York to Amman, Jordan, got on a 16-passenger flight from Amman 
to Baghdad. I took my guitar and a video camera and a couple friends. And I just went around and I played music on the streets of Baghdad for civilians in the daytime and for US soldiers at night. And there was one day when I went into this hospital and there was children in beds who had been um, blown up by, um, by, by bombs, mostly by cluster bombs, which are these bombs that blow up. But when they do, they put out these blue and yellow tennis balls basically that are plastic and they go all over the place. Some, most of them explode, but, but some of them don't. And kids see them and pick them up and they end up losing limbs. So I went and met all these, you know, probably 30 kids in this room and I had my guitar and their mothers were sitting and sleeping and living in the beds with them. Kids with legs blown off, limbs blown off, blind. And I play a, kid, a song for each kid and this, this doctor who's there with me, Iraqi woman, she's hustling me along and I'm like, no, I wanna take my time with this. And I went around to each kid and then she pulled me aside when we got finished out of the room and she said, you know, there's uh, six more floors that we have to go to. And there's 30 kids in each floor and this is just one hospital in Baghdad. So I was devastated, I was blown, just, just my heart was just exploding with, with uh, sadness, with anger, with every kind of emotion. And I was asked to go perform for some US soldiers that night in a bar. And uh, I had a friend, Barbara Lubin, and I said, who was with me, she, she was in her 70s at the time. And I said, you know, I don't know what to say to these soldiers who might've been the ones who did this to these kids. What do I say to them tonight? And so she says to me, it's not important what you say. What's important is that you just listen and that you show up to hear their experience and, and play the songs that come to you from your heart of, of, of sharing your experience. And that's what I did. And it was really a game changing moment for me because um, I listened to these, to these men and women who were there and talked to one guy who signed up September 12, 2001, the day after, the day after 9-11, when he thought he was going there for great reasons. And then he found out that, that there were no weapons of mass destruction there. And he's like, what the F am I doing here? You know? And so many stories of like, of that, of people who were really in their hearts wanting to do good things and found themselves in a really super challenging situation. And that's actually the way that most situations are in life. It's, you know, you, you look back on it and you think like Martin Luther King, he is so revered. We have statues of him. We have a holiday of him, national holiday. But at the time, he was one of the most hated men in America when they took polls. He was one of the most hated men in America. But he was on the side of his moral compass, of his values, of his saying that, that things could possibly be better. And that's what all of us have to do right now is not just read social media, not just look at what you know, political leaders or politicians or the president or anybody else says, but look within your heart. What are the values that you grow, grew up with? Did you grow up with the value that it was good to be kind to other people? Did you grow up with the value that everyone should be treated with equity and fairness? Did you grow up with the value that, that people shouldn't just be judged by, like Martin Luther King says, the color of their skin, but by the content of their character? Did you grow up with the value that everybody should have the same um, equal opportunities for financial success in our, in our communities, healthcare, education, those things? And if you did, then now is the time that we have to speak up and, and, and stand up for those values. And it's, it's, it's ugly and it's sticky, it's messy, but this is the time that we got to do it. So take us back, Michael. You were a scholarship basketball player at USF out of Davis High. And then yeah. I'm not sure whether you found music or music found you and you maybe kind of found your purpose. And, you know, you went from the beatniks to the – Jeff Day and I used to listen to the disposable heroes of hypocrisy. Okay? Yeah, so we, go the, we go all the way back. All the way back. <laughs> so I'm really interested in your transformation, and I read a little bit on it, and it just talk about just how your soul moved and how your mind moved and kind of went from this guy shooting hoops to kind of like, hey, there's something bigger out here. Yeah. You know, I'll take it all the way back to the very beginning, which is when I was born, I was given up for adoption. My biological mother is Irish, German, and Belgian, and my biological father is African-American and an Ottawa Indian from the mountains of Virginia. And I was adopted by the Franti family. Um, my mom was a school teacher in the public schools in, in Davis for about 30 years. My dad taught uh, math and uh, epidemiology at UC Davis. Um, and 
they had three kids of their own and they had adopted myself and another African-American son. So I grew up in this very mixed household. Um, it was a lot of complicated emotions just being a kid any, in any house. But when you're growing up in a house like that, and I was born in the mid 60s at the height of the civil rights movement. And, um, you know, my parents were amazing people to take that responsibility on of taking on these two black kids into this otherwise white family and creating this blended family. Um, and in some ways they were really prepared for it because they're really good people, but it's impossible to be prepared for everything that society is going to throw on you, all the pressures. And on top of that, for a lot of my childhood, my father was an alcoholic and he later in life, um, quit drinking and he actually became one of the most beautiful people I had ever met. Most, for most of my childhood, he had two emotions. It was just kind of like silence and cynicism. And, and, and then there was like rage and there wasn't much in between. But when he stopped drinking, he blossomed into this beautiful man. He actually had a stroke. And when he came back from the stroke, he, he became this super caring, kind, thoughtful person. And I remember sitting with him one day and I said, you know, dad, uh, it, was, it was one of the only times we ever went out to lunch because we had five kids. You didn't get to go out to lunch with dad alone ever. You know? Maybe there's once we went to Fluffy Donuts and got a donut together, but that was about it. But I said to him, this is when I was an adult, I said, Daddy, you know, it seems like you've changed so much. He said, you know, son, I haven't changed at all. And it was like the trombone of disappointment went off in my head. I was like, wah, 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 wah. But I said, what do you mean you haven't changed at all? You're like a totally different person. He said, you know, son, I've always been this way inside my heart. It's just that I was never able to show it. I was never able to express it when I was drinking. And now that I'm, I have clarity, um, I have more ease of heart. So things that are inside me, they, they flow more easily out. And um, I, he, he told me that made him feel happier and a, a more complete person. So how that all affected me um, growing up as a musician is that music and sports became the way that I went inside myself. When things were rough with my family at home, I would go and spend hours on the court just shooting baskets by myself. When things were, when my dad was drinking real hard, I, I would go and put music on and listen to my headphones and it would take me somewhere else. Or, I, or I'd listen to KDDS, which is an incredible music <laughs> station, you know, and hear this music from all over the world, you know? I'd hear music from Africa and Jamaica and from England and from, all over from South America and different, you know, electronic music. Now there's a hip hop show, now there's a punk rock show. And all these musics kind of fed into who I was. And so when I first got to USF and started playing basketball there, basketball for me was this really cathartic thing. It was like this way for me to get my energy out, my aggression out. And the more that I focused, the more that, the better I got at it. And the better I got at it, the more people said, hey man, you're doing all right. You're doing all right. You're, you're, you know, and, and that really felt good to me at times in my childhood when I was the most challenged. Um, but college sports is tough and um, there's a lot of pressure for teams to win. Um, there's a lot of pressure on coaches to take these 18 to, you know, 22 year old personalities from all over different walks of life and try to shape them into a team you know kids are worried about their playing time kids are worried now they're worried about their instagram you know there, there's there's so many things that are pressures out there and it stopped at a certain point being that cathartic thing that i did for fun and for enjoyment and to take my mind off the worries and it started to feel more like a job to me at a certain point and so i said let me just take a break and during that break, I, I, I transferred schools. And, um, and, I, and during that break, I started to experiment with music. And at the same time, I had my first uh, child, my son, Cappy, when, when I was still in college. I was, tw I was 20 when we conceived him, just barely turned 21. And I was, I was a bike messenger. I was working at a nightclub at night um, and in San Francisco. And I discovered that music was this way for me to just vent my frustrations, my anger. And so the first thing I got into was like really aggressive, industrial, kind of punk rock, the beatniks. And everything was about expressing what was outside. All these things that were happening in the world that were my way of just venting about what was going on. But then over time, and then, and then we started Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy. 
we were invited to go out on tour with U2. So I went out from, from being in this little punk rock van to now being playing in, in like the biggest stadiums in America, you know, football stadiums around the country. And, um, and it really, I really started to watch what U2 was doing and it really made me think about music differently. That, that it wasn't always about the big letter capital P politics that was so important, but sometimes it was more important if you wanted to really move the needle in somebody's life to t touch their heart and make them feel rather than just think about things. And so that's how my music started to evolve. And I, I was invited to play in a prison in the early 90s. And, and uh, I remember it was Thanksgiving. And at the end of my set, you know, I sang all these songs that were singing about the prison system and how messed up it was and all these, you know, social political things. And at the end of my set, this guy came up to me and said, you know, Michael, we are so grateful you came here put his arm around and said, I've been here for 22 years and I, I'm on a 30 year bid. And this is the first time we've had music here. And I, I was like the walls disappeared, it was amazing. He said, but you know what? I would really have appreciated if I could have heard a song about how much I miss my family on Thanksgiving, about how much I wanna be with my kids, about how much I would love to be dancing with my lady while we were cooking in the kitchen. And it made me think about music differently. That music didn't always have to be about venting your anger, about social political things, but there was this full spectrum, full rainbow of human emotions that there were to explore. And that's when I started doing Spearhead and really, really started to evolve and think about how I wanted to reach people. And the main thing I learned is the more of my heart that I put into it, the more it connects with, with people on a, um, on a really intimate level. Along with that, you got your foundation. I think it's called Do It For The Love. Is that, talk, yeah. talk about that. I think that's just an unbelievable uh, charitable group you got going there. Well, Do It For The Love was started six years ago. There was a, a man named Steve December and he started, his wife started tweeting me saying, my husband Steve has very advanced stages of ALS and he, he can no longer walk. He can't talk anymore. Um, ALS is one of the worst diagnoses you could ever get. One day your finger doesn't work and a week later your hand doesn't work and your arm and eventually you die of paralysis. And um, so she said, you're his favorite artist and he'd love to come see you play and it's probably going to be the last concert he ever gets to go to. So we invited them to the show, my wife and I, and we had them on the side of the stage and Steve was in a wheelchair and he couldn't even operate the chair. His wife had to move the joystick. And um halfway through the show i start playing this song called life is better with you and i look over at steve and he whispers into hope's ear he says he says hope i want to get up and dance and so with all her strength she lifts his rigged body up out of the wheelchair and they have this beautiful slow dance in front of twenty thousand fans who are screaming and crying and cheering and um i was screaming and crying and cheering, you know, and I look over my wife, my big tough bass player, he's got a tear coming down his eye, you know, and, and um, so afterwards I said, Steve, what did this mean to you? And he said, you know, Michael, yesterday, and, and his wife had to, he would mouth the words and his wife would, would interpret just from lip reading him. So he said through his wife, he said, yesterday I was wheeling around the festival and people would just look the other way because he said, I'm living life differently. You know, I drool, my body doesn't move right. And I used to be a hockey player and I used to be out in festivals party. And um, uh, I, I was, I, I, people would just ignore me. But after that moment on stage, suddenly I became Steve. And people were coming up saying, hey, Steve, come dance with me, Steve, come have a beer with us, Steve, come hang out in our, in our, in our camp, Steve, let's, let's, let's rock together. And it gave him like this sense of normalcy again. So I said to Sarah, I looked at her and I said, let's do this for as many families as we possibly can. So we started to do it for the love. And um, we bring people with advanced stages of life-threatening illness, children and adults with special needs and wounded veterans to see any live concert by any artist in the world. So people just write to us and they say, my brother just came back from Afghanistan, wants to go see Drake and Beyonce. My sister has stage four breast cancer. She's always wanted to go see Garth Brooks. 
you know, my son is autistic. He wants to go see um, Elmo or any, you know, any kind of music and, and we get them to the concerts. And the reason is that we, we believe in two things. First of all, we believe in the healing power of music to help people get through challenging times. And then secondly, we believe it's important for families to just have a break because when you're taking care of somebody who's really sick, um, it becomes a full-time job for the whole family. And families deserve to just have those, you know, that one night out. So we don't just send the one person, we send the whole family to go see these concerts. Can I write you in in the presidential election? Because I'm pretty sure I'm on, I'm all about on your ticket. I'm telling you right now, I'm a right. <laughs> I'm just telling you, right? You know, you, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's been frustrating for me over the last four years. You know, you know, growing up in Davis, it's, there, it's, it's a pretty progressive town, but for, for me, when I, when I grew up, you know, uh, the difference between Republicans and Democrats wasn't hate. The difference was, you know, maybe there was, uh, you know, the more fiscal responsibility was the argument of Democrats or of Republicans. And we wanted more, you know, social spending for healthcare or whatever the Democrat, or for Democrats, but there wasn't this hate. There wasn't, you know, the president every day tweeting, putting people from his own administration on blast or, or tweeting out things like he did the other day. Like when, when you, they start looting, we're going to start shooting. Like these are not things that we should ever see um, from anybody. Like I wouldn't accept that from my own children if they did that. And, um, and yet we have a president who's doing that. And, and, it, and it hurts me. Like every day I wake up and I feel pain for our country because um, I know of the struggles that so many people have experienced. And I grew up in a mixed family. You know, I know what <laughs> the differences are, or, or the similarities are between all of us people. And I truly believe that as I've traveled around the world, I'm in Indonesia right now. As I've traveled around the world to Africa, South America, all over Asia, all over Europe, you know, um, Australia, New Zealand, so many different places, um, the Middle East, I have found that people are basically, I would say about 99% the same. We all want food. We all want shelter. We all want education. We all want, when we hurt, we want to be able to heal ourselves. We all want to have time dan off to dance and party and celebrate. We all, we all do the basic things. And when we sit down, like there, there's no one that I, that I, I believe there's no one that you wouldn't love if you knew their story. If you just took the time to just sit down. And I, and I know that because I saw it in Iraq between US soldiers and Iraqi civilians who would see each other on a daily basis and started out being enemies. And by the end of a few months of seeing each other, they were talking to each other like they were best friends. And, and um, so people are the, mostly the same. And in that fraction of a percentage that you know 0.1 percent that makes us all different that's actually where the beauty is that's actually where the real beauty is the things that make us different are make, what make us be incredible and as you know with sports you know you, you take a, a group of athletes they all come from different backgrounds they come from different walks of life they come from different energy levels some of them you, you've got, you can really push on them hard and they want that. Some of them, they want you to really be more mindful and just and talk to them from, you know, the, the intellect of things. Everybody is different. And, and that's what makes um, a team coming to bet together be so powerful. It's like if you make a fruit salad and all you got is like the lemon, you know, it's not going to be really great. But if you got a fruit salad, strawberries, watermelon, banana, peaches, you know, rambutan, which is a great fruit we have here in Indonesia. And then you squirt some lemon on it. Whoa, it all comes to life. You know, we don't all have to be the same. And in fact, the beauty is in the difference. And, and that's really what I've learned in, in all my travels is that, that different is beautiful. Well, you have been around the globe. I haven't been all the places you have. You've been around now. You're actually stranded a little bit down there in Indonesia. And yeah. I know you got a, I got a new album come out, Work Hard, Be Nice, trying to get yeah. back on tour. But talk to us a little about the development of that. I know your time's valuable. I just want to hear about that. And yeah. then we're going to cut you loose. And we're going to play a little cut from uh, I'm on your side from that. But 
just talk about your next tour and your new album and the work hard be nice sure. theme. well last year we were out on tour and I, I'm, I'm an artist who's perennially on tour so for the last 30 years i've spent six months of my life on the road um and now i spend even l less time in in america than i than i have because we're on the road six months mostly traveling around the states and europe and australia but then I, I own a business here in Indonesia. I started a hotel here. It's a yoga hotel called Soul Shine. We bring groups of people uh, on yoga retreats, 30 or 40 people at a time. They swim, they get to um, you know, practice yoga, uh, sit in the sun, be in the jungle, experience nature, and really hit the reset button on life. And, and find a new way of just going back and, and, and facing life with their full optimism and energy again. And so I'm equally committed to that as I am to my, my music. Um, so we were over here leading a yoga retreat and we had planned on being on tour starting on April 18th. We're supposed to play at AT&T Stadium where the Dallas Cowboys play. <laughs> and that was the start of a tour that was gonna take us all the way through Labor Day. Then we had a couple of weeks off in September. Then we were going all the way up till, till Christmas um, in Europe and other shows in the States. And um, this year we we're doing something very different. We we're going to be touring with Kenny Chesney, uh, who's one of the biggest names in country music. I don't know anything about country music except I like a lot of Kenny's songs. We became friends throughout the years, and um, and and Kenny just said, "Hey man, I think it would be cool with everything that's going on in the world if you and I toured together right now." And and so we we put this tour together and. Um, uh, so I was supposed to be out with Kenny right now, and uh, a couple weeks before the tour started, you know, the quarantining started coming into play, like, is this going to happen? It's going to happen. Quarantine hit, and, and then the airport here in Indonesia shut down. In Bali, I'm in Bali. The Bali airport has been closed down for more than a month, and so there's no flights going in or out. So technically, I'm stranded on a tropical island, you know. <laughs> Don't feel bad for me. But, um, you know, uh, the things, some of the observations that I've had personally during the quarantine is that um, all of us are living these lives where um, we, we expect things to have a certain um, rhythm to them or a certain normality to them and when things happen that suddenly change uh, it's 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 challenging for us you know um, for me as a as just as a um, uh, a person I'm, I'm 54 years old and uh, you know I'm worried about my health you know I, I'm like if I get COVID what, what is this going to mean and, and I actually did get sick for about seven days I was really sick I never got tested but I felt I, like I had all the symptoms of it. And I was laying in bed, like, just, just worried. Like, am I gonna be there? I have a 20 month old son. I've got two sons that are both grown and out of the house. You know, uh, I have the responsibility of, uh, you know, 20 um, plus em employees in, within my band and, and our touring family, and then 40 employees here at the hotel. Like, how, how am I gonna keep this all going financially with no business in either business? You know, and just the stresses of, of wondering what is the world going to be uh, become after this you know is it is it, is it going to be changed forever or are, are things going to return and then at the same time being awakened to so many beautiful things you know the time i've spent with my family i've spent more time with them this year than i than i have in the last 30 years you know um the the chance to uh, explore new technologies of which to communicate um, with with our fans um, writing tons of new music, making tons of, of, of videos, and then also thinking of wellness differently than I ever did before. Because wellness used to just be, well, oh, I'll eat an organic salad on Wednesday, I'll catch a yoga class on Saturday, and now I'm well. But um, last year, I made a commitment to my health. And um, I was 30 pounds heavier than I am today. I started training, I started eating differently. Um, and now, uh, and the, the main thing I learned is that it's possible to break habits that aren't serving you anymore and create new habits that can serve you. And, you know, throughout my life in sports, I had always known that, but somewhere along the way as an adult, I forgot that I really needed to take care of myself. 
And I believe that that's something that people are really, uh, post COVID wellness is going to be different than eating that one organic salad every, every week. It's going to be, you know, what is my blood pressure like? Am I close to being diabetic? Am I eating healthy foods? Am I exercising on a regular basis? Am I able to be alone? Am I able to be with my emotions and not feel like I'm going fucking crazy? Am I able to have financial security so that if things do go crazy, that I'm, I'm, I'm going to have wellness in that area of my life? Um, are my relationships um, flowing well? And in general, am I feeling happy and, and, and successful? And, and success to me is being happy with yourself. That's what it means is being happy with yourself, not being happy with whatever else is going on in the world, not being happy with all these other things, but being happy with yourself and the role that you're playing in, in connecting to the world. And that's what true wellness is. And, and, um, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to connect with people about these days is, is that sense of optimism of spirit that helps to get us through these challenging times. Well, like I said, I, I'm a little older than you. I've just followed you, and it's been so cool to just watch the progression, watch your growth, and because uh, I've seen your growth as a person and musically, and just so cool to see your your whole path and how inspirational. I know a ton of people that uh, you know are super fired up about your music. I kind of like I go back all the way. So even some of the guys on our team, I'm kind of going, "Hey, you want to hear some social rap? You better go stay human right here. Have you heard of my yeah. guy right here?" And then yeah. the, I go, hey, that's pretty good. I'm like, yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, I know your time is valuable, Michael. And, I, you know, you're a Davis guy. And I just have so much respect for you and so much admiration. And you're super inspirational to me. I hope a lot of people watch this. And I hope they take notes, man, because we can learn a lot from where you're at and where you've been. And uh, so we're going to cut you loose and wish you well. And uh, I'd love to see that six-foot-six frame doing some yoga. I got to tell you that right oh, now. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I want to come see. I want to come and see a UC Davis football game. You know, it's been many years, and uh, I, I just want to say that I'm really ha happy that you're at the helm there. There's such a great history there of of football, and such a great history of coaches. You know, Coach Soaker, who is so influential in in all of football today. Really, his his energy and his coaching style was felt through you know the 49ers and beyond. You know, and and, and, and now you're there with the spirit of optimism, of embracing things that are different, um, of seeing kids of all different experiences coming together and being able to shape them in a positive way. And that it's bigger than just um, the, you know, those, those hours on the field that, that, it, that it goes beyond that, you know, and um, young athletes who are out there who, who, are, who are thinking about going to Davis, there's, you know, there's, there, there isn't a better person that you could be with <laughs> And if you're a parent, you know, if you, you think you want to send your kid off for four years to hang out with, with somebody who's going to have a good effect on your kid, Dan is somebody who for sure is that. So, so thanks for, for your leadership there. And, um, you know, it extends to all areas of life. It extends, it's, it's in sports, it's in business, it's in politics, it's in education, it's in music, it's in so many things. But we need um, leadership out, out there that, that is speaking to the experience experience of recognizing that people are different and um, that it's okay to be different and that different is beautiful. Yeah. And you're beautiful. So I appreciate you, man. We're going to play a little cut here. We end from your album here. Work hard, be nice. I'm on your side. People need to hear that, need to buy that album and uh, good luck to you. And I hope to see you back here, Davis. Come watch a game. Thanks, bro. Let's, get a, let's get a concert afterwards. How would that be? I'd love, Oh, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Oh, all right, All man. Right. Appreciate you, Michael. Thanks right. a lot. Peace. Thanks, Mark. Too. Peace. If you ever lay awake at night, wondering if we'll be alright, I'm on your side. I'm on your side. If you're sitting at the kitchen table. Counting up your bills to pay I'm on your side I'm on your side If you drop the kids at school and wonder If they'll make it home today I'm on your side I'm on your side If you're staring
Yelling at the TV stations Wondering how we got this way I'm on your side I'm on your side Can you hear me? Is your heart beating like a drum? Can you hear me? I don't care where you come from I am on your side 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 Ice is clinking in your cup You're thinking about giving up I'm on your side I'm on your side You got the news today Doctors telling you to pray I'm on your side I'm on your side And if you feel the pounding fear When flashing lights are in your mirror I'm on your side I'm on your side And if you hold a friend and say I wonder how we got this way I'm on your side I'm on your side Can you hear me? Is your heart beating like a drum? Can you hear me? I don't care where you come from Remember how to dance and if you're out of tears to cry, take my hand.